Yeah, I mean, as I told you before we started recording, I'm very interested in spatial navigation, not really for my own research, but kind of just something I'm really interested in. And I've had a few guests and they all come from the rodent and human research directions or approaches or whatever. And uh, so I'm really looking forward today to talk uh, to you about a very different kind of species, uh, one that I've never, I mean, all of the, I mean, the species is mantis shrimp. All of the mantis shrimp papers for spatial navigation I've read are yours. Um, so, yeah, I thought we could maybe start by just outlining or have you maybe briefly explain what a mantis shrimp is, because, uh, I mean, it's a shrimp, so I'm assuming it's in water. Um, we're quickly ending <laughs> the, the things I know about mantis shrimps. Uh, so maybe can you, yeah, just give a brief, um, uh, I don't know, like what, what sure. Uh, yeah. Where might I find them? What do they do? Yeah. Yeah. Kinda... So mantis shrimp, uh, they're wonderful animals. Uh, they're crustaceans, like, as you might guess from the name, uh, they're actually not really a shrimp, but that's, that's a whole nother thing. It's, they're kind of separated from decapod crustaceans, which are shrimp and crabs. They're their own little group. Um, but these animals are really cool. They're predatory crustaceans, and they live mostly in tropical areas worldwide. But they can uh, be found in some temperate regions as well. It's a pretty diverse Such order. Like... Uh, so, for instance, you can find them throughout the tropics. But I grew up in Southern California, and we have a species that lives along the Southern California coast. Um, on the east coast of the United States, there's also species that can be found as well. In the Mediterranean, we have uh, mantis shrimp species. So they can be found, you know, on the coast of Japan. So they're, they're pretty nicely spread worldwide in, in, in oceans. So they're only found in seawater. Um, and these animals, uh, they're best known for two things. The first thing is that they're very aggressive animals. And they have these appendages, these, uh, these raptorial appendages, they're called, which are things that use to either smash things open or to spear things. Um, so they're predatory. And they, there's these two classes. The smashers. So how big are they? Uh, so they can, they, they, there's a range of sizes for these animals. They can be really tiny, maybe like half the size of your little finger, up to the size of your whole forearm. So there's a there's a there's quite a diverse a range yeah. of, of these animals. Yeah. And uh, these two classes are the smashers that use their, uh, their arms like hammers that will find snail shells or crabs or other things and smash them open with an incredibly powerful strike. Uh, the acceleration of this uh, of this smash is, can match that of a 12, 22 caliber rifle bullet being fired. Um, so it, it's extremely powerful. And then there's the other class of mantis shrimp, which are called spears. And if you look at the this raptorial appendage, this arm, it looks like a big spearing type thing with a lot of barbs in it. And what they'll do is they these animals they live in holes in the seafloor environment. And uh, these spears will just sit inside their burrows and look for fish to pass by. And when they see one, they'll go up and just spear the fish and pull it back into their burrows and eat them. So they, they, they're they only predatory, but they do a really good job at hunting and finding their prey. Nice. Very violently. Okay, they, <laughs> they eat just anything that's smaller than them? Or, I mean, do you mention snails, fish? Yeah, yeah anything uh, that they can catch that is smaller or even approaching the same size as them. So I've seen mantis shrimp kill things that are about the same size, same size as them, uh, like crabs or other shrimp. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's, one, that's one thing that they're really well known for. And the other thing that they're really well known for are their visual systems. So they have these really wonderful eyes. They have eye stalks. So their, their eyes are on these stalks that are on their head. And they can uh, move their eyes independently from one another. So they will twist their eyes, they'll move them around up and down. And generally what they do is if you watch a mantis shrimp, you generally see its head poking out of its burrow and its eyes are scanning its environment. And like I said before, their eyes can be looking at different things independently. But as soon as something interesting passes their field of view, they usually have both eyes snap together and follow this interesting thing in their, in their visual space. Um, so their eyes are really interesting because they have depth perception with just one eye. So they have three parts of their of each eye where they can estimate the field of view of something. Um, but they also have uh, a wide diversity of photoreceptors. And these are the cells that are responsible for perception of specific spectral information, so like colors, and also something that we can't perceive, but most animals, since most animals are not vertebrates, 
uh, can see, and that's polarized light. Uh, so mantis shrimp have the greatest diversity of these photoreceptors out of any animal on the planet. Uh, so they can see far into the UV and and far into the infra, or quite far into the reds as well, approaching like the very closest uh, range of far red. Um, so they have this yeah really nice diversity of spectral channels, and they can see polarized light as well. I'm curious. I mean, you mentioned they have depth perception in each of their eyes. So when they find something they find interesting, but they they still use both eyes to look at them, is that just I don't know, to get two slightly different perspectives on it, or because I mean, I guess usually like. I guess with other predator animals, you use both eyes to get depth perception, right? But if they don't need that, um, is it, yeah? Yeah, well, to tell you the truth, I don't know how accurate um, a single eye's depth perception versus having two eyes might be. Perhaps it, it, it's better to estimate these sorts of depth information or they can better track their prey if they use both eyes. I'm not really quite sure why um, they do this, but they do, if something interesting passes their field of view, they usually do, like both eyes will snap onto that. And in the eye, there's a certain region, same as our eyes, that have higher acuity or like uh, resolution than the rest of your eye would have. And in mantis shrimp and in most uh, animals, there's an area of the compound eye that has higher acuity as well. So it's perhaps to keep the high acuity vision in in uh, in both our eyes as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, one thing I'm curious about. So you in one of the I think this might be in your current biology paper that we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a second. Um, I think you mentioned in the beginning that there hadn't really been any um, study of path integration in purely aquatic animals until your mantis from paper. And that that was kind of interesting, or that, that, that aquatic animals are interesting in that regard because visual cues are much harder to use because you can't see as far as you can on land or these kind of things. And I don't know, this just makes me wonder, like, if... I don't know, if it is harder to see underwater, uh, I mean, this is almost a silly question, but like, why do they have such amazing eyes <laughs> if uh, you can see less in the environment they're in? Yeah, it's, or, a, that's, it's a good question. So, um, so mantis shrimp, most species live in fairly shallow water. Uh, and fairly shallow tropical water, it's quite clear water, so it is still, the visibility isn't terrible. And you have a good amount of spectral information in very shallow coral reefs where you can often find mantis So shrimp. very shallow means uh, what <laughs> like what humans could stand in or what does shallow mean? Yeah, uh, I guess there is the a... the sea can be, go very deep, right? Yes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So shallow water, I mean, farther than people can stand in, I would say, but maybe within diving range, regular diving range from like 30 meters depth and then even shallower. And in these very shallow reefs in like which you could probably swim and just like free dive a couple meters down to a lot of mantis shrimp species live in this kind of range as well. Um, so the, the other thing that I haven't told you about mantis shrimp is that many species are also flamboyantly colored. Um, so you might see that there's colorful structures on their bodies. And since mantis shrimp are so aggressive, they're actually quite territorial over their homes, these burrows as well. And uh, mantis shrimp will make these visual uh, signals to one another where they have, for instance, one, one, uh, thing that they all do is they do this threatening response where they lift both their smashing arms and they show the inner sides of their arms. And in the inner sides of many species, there's this circular um, pattern, like an eye spot kind of. Um, and in different species, they that have a bright color. So my species I use mostly for the papers we're going to talk about had this bright purple uh, eye spot surrounded by a white uh, ring. They will show this at one another or at me. Like I've had Matt Shrimp show me this as well as like a threat kind of to follow you around and show you their arms like this. Um, so, so it can be really important to be able to communicate, to show intention, especially when you have weaponry that may be uh, destructive. Hmm. Okay, this now makes me think of a very important question. Have you ever been attacked by a mantis shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> I have been smacked a couple times by a mantis shrimp. They've both been kind of grazes. One time I had a fairly thick glove on and it hit me in the in the finger and it swelled up a little bit. Uh, on the other time, I was also struck on the very side of my uh, index finger. And even though it wasn't a direct hit, my finger swelled up a good amount. Uh, I have had a, I have a colleague that had got hit in the center of, their, of his thumb and blood just okay. poured down his arm after that. <laughs> nice. So, so it can happen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I never thought that working with shrimps would be that dangerous but i guess they were if it's a if it's um, a mantis shrimp then maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 okay um yeah getting to to the actual papers you wrote and the research you've done on spatial navigation um i mean yeah, 
why use Mantis Shrimp for this? Though? I mean, so that you're you're investigating path integration, which we can explain in a second, maybe. But yeah, I'm just curious, like, why this particular species for this task? Is it just you were working on the species and thought this would be a cool experiment, or is a uh, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it was that's a good question. Um, so it actually kind of happened by accident, really. Um, so when I started my PhD, I had an idea. So I was interested in how complex physiology evolves. And I was thinking about doing some sort of project like this. So while I was collecting mantis shrimp in the field, I noticed that they seem to have a really great spatial awareness of their surroundings. Like when you try to catch them, they won't always run away from you. Sometimes they'll run, you know, even at an angle somewhat towards you to the nearest cover. Um, and I just, I guess just seeing this while I was collecting mantis shrimp as like a starting off PhD student made me think about, well, how are they doing this? How do they keep track of their surroundings? And I was never someone that ever thought about navigation or spatial orientation before, but I don't know. I just thought that was interesting. And I started devising like little experiments where I made these large arenas and it was all really exploratory to begin with. And I never even thought about really path integration uh, until the data started kind of showing me that these are the questions I should be asking. Um, so I guess I could talk more about like how this uh, happened if you want, or unless you have a very specific question. Uh, yeah. Happy, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so after I kind of noticed this and started having these ideas, the species that I worked with, um, I work with, they're, they're found, they're the closest mantis shrimp species that are, that were available to me. So I did my PhD at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So this is on the East coast of the United States, not too far from Washington, DC, right outside of Baltimore. And, uh, in the Florida Keys, that's, uh, that's like the closest Caribbean you can get to from, um, Baltimore, uh, there's a species of very shallow water mantis shrimp called Neogondatlas oristidae. They're the species that I work with. They're about the size of your index finger. That's how big they can get to. They can just from between half your, that size to about that size. And uh, these animals, they live in really shallow water. They live in rubble or sponges, really anything that you can have little holes in. They spend most of their day in these holes where they're safely concealed from their predators and they're just looking out in their environment. But every now and again, they do have to leave for hunting, for instance. So they'll leave their burrows and hunt. And um, it's presumed that they would get back to them again. But we didn't really know this. So I got some of these animals and I built these circular arenas, which are just these baby pools that are about a meter and a half in diameter. I filled them with sand. And then I made these artificial burrows out of PVC pipe. And I put them in, in the arena. And I stood them up so that way the burrows were hidden from view uh, because like the rim of the burrow was about coplanar with the surface of the sand so if the animal is away from it it couldn't necessarily see its home it'd have to find it by some other means um, so i put this burrow there and then i included a landmark right next to it and then i put the animal in and i wanted to see if it would be happy living in this little burrow in this environment and it did it adopted it really quickly so that was really nice uh, and then I wanted to see, okay, well, what happens if I put some food in the arena? Will the animal actually like to go and find the food? Um, and mantis shrimp, they don't really like being out in the open very much. They prefer being near edges and under rocks and things like this. But if there was no rocks available, like, would they just hug the wall of the pool or would they eventually find the food? So I got some snail shells and I stuffed it with pieces of, like, white leg shrimp, like what people eat. Um, and I put them in the center of the arena and I... Uh, saw that the mantis shrimp would eventually leave the burrows. They kind of would walk around and do this thing uh, where they, they have, uh, so mantis shrimp head, what it looks like, are two big eyes. And then they have a couple uh, projections below their eyes. They're called antennae and antennules. There's two pairs of these things. But the antennules are the parts of their bodies that they use for chemosensation. So you will so you can see that they'll come out of their burrows. And, cool. Yeah, exactly. Basically. Yeah. yeah, so they'll they'll flick their antennules, like, and that's kind of like analogous to us sniffing, you know, Just sampling their environment for any chemicals. So you'd see them kind of flick their antennules, move a bit, flick it again, and eventually find the food. Um, and I found that once with the landmark there, when they found the food, they would get the food and then just make this really beautiful, quick path back to the home again. So they made these really slow, tortuous, twisty paths away from the home to find the food. And once they found the food, they made a nice straight path back to the burrow once more. Um, so that was really cool. That was maybe one of the most exciting parts of my PhD was seeing that this thing actually kind of worked. And there was, okay, there's a system here that I can actually 
work with and I can figure out, well, how are they doing this? Um, so that was like how the whole, this whole thing started. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing I always f found interesting that's in, in both your current biology paper and in the proceedings B paper, I think you have this phrase that might shrimp use a torturous path to the food. I was just curious, like, what, do you, what, what does that exactly mean? Um, but torturous, does that just mean... Twisty. Uh, okay, <laughs> twisty doesn't mean like that. It sounded like they were like a, I don't know, like a like a hero in a fairy tale or something where they had to like overcome huge barriers or fight off. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes how long it takes the animals to find the food, it feels like that, right? It's just like featureless environment and they're just searching and searching and searching. Uh, sometimes it could extend for a while to like half an hour in this little space um, before finding the food. But even after that, once they find the food, they'll make a straight direct path back home. Yeah, I mean, maybe do you want to then um, just briefly kind of describe kind of the main findings from the current biology paper? So, um... so after after the story I just told you, I found that even without this landmark around, the magic shrimp, even after finding the food, will make a nice really straight path back either to the home or near the home. And they make this straight line, but once they get close to the home, they will stop and they'll turn and then they'll make these patterns or, that are composed of these loops that seem to increase in size over time before finding their home eventually. So even without the landmark, they're still finding the home. Uh, and this made me wonder, okay, how exactly are they doing this? Um, so this is the paper that you're talking about now, the current biology paper. Um, I found that they use path integration to be able to locate their homes. And what path integration is, uh, in human navigation terms, like sailors, they call this dead reckoning. But what this means, it's, this is called vector navigation where when an animal has some sort of interesting place in their environment, so for the mantis shrimp, it would be their burrow, that's a reference point for their navigational system. And when they leave their reference point, their home, they will continually monitor both the angles that they turn and the distances they travel in all those angles to continually update where they think their home should be. And this is the straightest path back to that reference location, back to their home. So if, uh, so if they're continually integrating both the turns they make and the distances that they travel along these discrete directions, they can then calculate at any point in time the most direct path, both direction and distance, to get back to where they started again. And this is called path integration. Uh, so this is adding up all these vectors to be able to calculate this most direct vector, vector back. Yeah, and I mean, like in the, the literature I'm familiar with, with rodents, I mean, the the one of the earliest studies of, um, or, yeah, one of the f like integral studies by um, Edward Tolman. He kind of used this with rats to figure out whether they did this and they had this like, um, what was it? Um, I can't remember right now off the top of my head the specific example, but basically they figured, he figured out that rats could use shortcuts. So they have to like use a kind of circuitous way. And then once they realize like, oh wait, there's a shortcut. So this kind of, again, is kind of like some sort of evidence that they, they know like uh yeah just where they are relative to where they came from mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's just like a it's, a, it's funny because it's like just such a fundamental aspect of uh life you know when you walk somewhere you know like oh i can just walk that way again and then i'll come back to where i started off even though it's not the right way I came there first and mm -hmm. i guess you kind of to some sense maybe or well, path integration is let's say very useful for that Yes. Um, yeah. 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 And I think different animals have different uh, resolutions for how accurate they can be while path integrating. But yes, it, it is something that most, many, if not most animals have some at least basic sense of. Yeah. And by the way, do you know, if, has this been done? I guess not, but has this been done in fish or something like that? I don't know. It seems like it uh, would have been, but no, no, not that I know of at least. Um, no. And I think, uh, so a good example of an animal that can, that's been studied for a while that really does this extremely well, a better resolution than any vertebrate that I know could ever do, are these uh, small desert ants that live in the Sahara Desert. And they'll travel hundreds and hundreds of meters, like up to kilometers, a, a, a kilometer away from their nests in this featureless environment and be able to get back to their nests again using these straight line paths. Um, and for anim animals like these, like mantis shrimp too, that to be able to do this, you have to have some sort of some sort of directional sense, some sort of, some sort of way of estimating the angles that you turn 
and some way of estimating the distances you travel. So you have to have a biological odometer and a biological compass of some sort. Um, and I think it depends on which information you use. You can be quite accurate with it, depending on how you do this exactly. And if you use something like your vestibular system, maybe you might not be as accurate as if you were using some sort of stable structure in your, in your environment, like the sun, for instance. That's a lot more predictable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one thing I was curious about is that, I mean, maybe we have to mix up the papers now, is that, um, I mean, one thing you show in the current biology paper is that mantis shrimp use the sun um, to, I guess, correct their path integration or as a, yeah, uh, they kind of use the sun to to do path integration, let's say. Exactly, and, yeah. Um, and then you have this other paper in Proceedings B where you say um, they are also can use landmarks, right? Um, which is, uh, in a way, like a very standard kind of uh, two different ways that animals can use to navigate. And usually, I don't, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an expert in this field, but I feel like everything I've read, species can do both, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but one question I had was like, do they, is the sun just a landmark? Yeah, so so when I talk about landmarks, I think of them as some sort of marker that you can mark a specific pl position on the planet. So it's a it's a place, it's a positional marker. Well, the sun will, can never be this because it's, at least to something that's earthbound, seems infinitely far away. So it can give you a direction, but it can't really give you a position on, on the planet. Does that make right. sense to you? Yeah, 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 that's a fair point. It's not something you walk past and then you go like, okay, I'll walk until the sun, and then after that I go left. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, okay, I guess that's a, that's a good way of differentiating it. And, and no matter how, how, many, how long you walk towards the sun, it will not look different, right? It will look the same. If, as if, this, if the sun stayed in the same place in the sky, you can never ha walk towards it and have it grow larger. Well, with landmarks, you can't. Right. So this gives you this can give you information of where to go exactly a landmark can, while the sun can only give you a directional information. So in this way, it's a good compass because it can give you your angular displacement, so the turns you make really accurately, but it will never tell you a position on in this right, in the yeah. planet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess you had like kind of a series of questions in this current budget paper. First was like whether they use path integration, and the second was then kind of how did they do this? Um, or what factors influence it? So yeah, maybe can you just a brief, I mean, you use a few kind of fairly straightforward and I think fairly standard experiments for testing, like, yeah, whether animals use bath integration, that kind of thing. Um, could you just briefly describe the, the rotations you do with the animals and uh, other mean confusing things? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or the displacement, or yeah. It's like to talk about how to prank mantis shrimp. Uh, yeah, I can <laughs> yeah tell you exactly. This. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, so after I found that they were still able to make these nice straight lines back home, even with no landmark there, I was interested if the, the if mantis shrimp were using path integration. Uh, so to do this, um, I built this track, and I had a platform that I that I put on this track, and on the center of the platform I placed their food, uh, and I'd wait for mantis shrimp to find the food on this platform, and once they found the food, I slowly pulled them along this track to a new location in the arena, uh, very slowly. So. Um, Mantis shrimp are extremely flighty animals, so if they see you all of a sudden, or they, they will just run in, the, in, in some direction. Uh, so you have to be very sneaky when you're doing this. But yeah, so you carefully move them to a new location in the arena, and you wait to see how they go home. And if they're using path integration, this vector-based navigation, uh, it predicted that if they, weren't, if they didn't notice they were being moved, they should uh, travel parallel to had they not been displaced to be able to find their home. But if they were able to um, integrate this movement or they weren't using path integration, but they were using some other cues in the environment that I hadn't accounted for or odor or something along these lines, they should still be able to go home even after the displacement. So after pulling the, uh, the mantis shrimp on the track, I found that they made these paths that were parallel to had they not been displaced. And even these search patterns I talked about where they make these search points that are centered around where they think the home should be were generally centered around that spot where the home should have been if they had not been moved. So this really showed that they were using this path integration behavior to find uh, the strategy to find their way home. But they they always had the sun. Uh, the sun was at the same point, right? Or um, actually, so for these experiments, I had them under uh, in a greenhouse under open sky. Uh, so the sun was available, but it's not at the same point in every time. So it could be moving. It could move around a bit. Um, the sky had other things in it, obviously, depending on the day. 
Um, but regardless, they were making these nice paths back home, uh, or at least where home should have been had they not been displaced after the displacement. So this showed that they were using path integration. Yeah, and then uh, one thing I found kind of interesting, um, or another thing I found kind of interesting, is um, you mentioned yeah, this one abstract called a hierarchy of compass cues. Um, so yeah, what's the hierarchy? And um... <laughs> sure, yeah, we can talk about this. So um, so like I mentioned before, so since Mantis from using path integration, they have to have two things at least to be able to do this. They have to have some sort of directional sense, some sort of way of monitoring the angles they turn, and then an odometer as well. So in the paper, I then investigated what kind of orientation cues were they using to measure the, the angles they turned. I mean, animals can use all sorts of cues for orientation. Other animals can use things from celestial cues like the sun in the sky to the vestibular systems or any sort of proprioceptive information. They use the Earth's geomagnetic field for directional information as well. So um, since these were all potential options, I uh, used an experiment um, where I, instead of having this platform that can be pulled along a track, I placed in the center of the arena a platform that can be rotated on its axis. And I placed food on that platform. So once Mantis Shrimp found the food, I would rotate them 180 degrees very, very slowly. Um, and uh, I did this under open skies outdoors. Um, and I did this under different environmental conditions as well. I did this when there was an overcast day, when there's no sky visible. I did this on a nice clear day when the sun was clearly visible in the sky. And I also did this on days when the sun was blocked by clouds, but there's still big patches of blue sky available. I let them find the food and find their way home. And then I let them find the food and rotated them 180 degrees as well. And I found that when I didn't manipulate them, if I just let them find the food and find their way home without turning them, under all these conditions, they were able to find the food and return back home just fine. However, after I rotated the animals on the platform, I found that after rotation, mantis shrimp would still go home correctly despite being rotated 180 degrees if there was either the sun in the sky or patches of blue sky in the sky. But if there was a heavily overcast day with no sky information at all, mantis shrimp generally oriented in the opposite direction of their home. So from this information, I could tell that there was some information in the sky that they could use for orientation, but they also had some sort of backup system that they seemed to use that wasn't celestial information based, but it seemed that there was something that we call idiothetic information. And this is uh, ways of using your self motion to determine the direction you've moved, kind of like your vestibular system. If I closed, if you closed your eyes and I turned you left, even though you hadn't turned left yourself, you could probably tell you were turned left because of your inner ear, right? Um, so they might have some sort of system like this in order to estimate how they've turned as well. Perhaps they could feel some of their turn in some sort of way. And I'm not sure how this is the case, but since they're orienting the opposite direction after being turned 180 degrees, it showed that this system is there. Uh, but they clearly prefer to use celestial information since when cues in the sky were visible, they were orienting to them since they were going correctly home even after being rotated. So in order to determine which celestial cues they're using, uh, there's a couple cues that they could potentially use, the first being the sun in the sky. But there are also other information in the sky that may not be that obvious to us, but to other animals may be very obvious. And uh, one thing that I mentioned before is that mantis shrimp, as well as many invertebrate animals, um, can detect polarized light. So they're able to, S to determine the polarization of light, which is just another quality of light like color is. Uh, color is uh, is how our brain processes different wavelengths of light or the energy of these photons moving in space. While polarized light is, uh, it, it talks about the polarization or the um, the orientation of, we call this electric vectors or magnetic vectors of these food photons moving in space. And if all the photons are moving in the same direction, have the same electric vector, then the high light is very polarized. While if uh, if these photons are moving with different orientations, it's unpolarized light. And sunlight is unpolarized, but by some sort of processes that's due to scattering, uh, there becomes a very strong polarization pattern in the sky that if you had polarization vision, you'd be able to observe. So generally 90 degrees from the sun's position in the sky, if you had polarized vision, you'd be able to see that there's a band of highly polarized light. And some animals can use this for orientation. So one animal that's been shown to use this for orientation is the honeybee. I think it's one of the first animals that was showed to be able to orient using this kind of cue. And mantis shrimp have polarization vision. This has been shown before, and most of their eye is a good polarization sensor. 
So because of this, um, that was a potential option of what Mandelstrom could have been using as well. So in order to test to see if they were using the sun or these polarization cues, um, I used this experiment that actually had been done the first time, I think, maybe 1910 with ants. <laughs> this guy that was, it was a, uh, I think he was like a Swiss-French guy that was living in Tunisia when the French had that as a colony at one time. He, uh, with, with desert ants, he, uh, he did this really clever trick where he covered the sun with a board and then used a mirror to reflect the sun on the opposite side of the sky from the sun actually was to make it appear to the ant that the sun was on the opposite side of the sky from where it actually was located. So I used the same trick to see if mantis shrimp would orient using the sun. So I had this setup where I had a whiteboard that I tied with a rope. And when the mantis shrimp finally got to the center of the arena, I had a mirror in my hand as well. I flipped the board up to shade the, the um, arena from the sun and then used the mirror to flip it to the other side. And after doing this, I found that most mantis shrimp would navigate to the other side of the arena from their home, from their burrows before searching. So this showed they were using the sun for orientation. But they could also orient even when the sun wasn't present, as long as there's patches of blue sky available. Um, so I also wanted to test if mantis shrimp could use polarized light for orientation as well. And to do this, I built a slightly different setup where I put it in a dark room and I made this artificial polarized light field above the arena that the mantis shrimp were in. And once mantis shrimp found the food, I rotated this polarized light field that I created 90 degrees. And I found that when I did this, mantis shrimp would also orient 90 degrees in response to this polarized light field as well. So this really gave this hierarchy that you asked about. It, it took shape, where it seems that at least most mantis shrimp prefer to orient to the sun when it's available. But when it's not available, they still prefer to orient to celestial cues like the polarized light field that's present in the sky. And then finally, when all um, celestial cues are obscured, you know, like under a really heavily overcast day, they seem to rely on other information like idiothetic or this self-motion information to estimate the turns that they make. And this it, it does seem hierarchical in nature, at least within the setup that I have in the conditions I gave the mantis. And they may be able to use more cues as well, like water currents, if there were any available, but I didn't test right, any of those much. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's I find it interesting because it's, I mean, the, the hierarchy that you describe is also in terms of like how reliable the signal kind of is, right? Like the, the sun's, I mean, it, it moves relative to, you know, or the earth moves relative to the sun, but um, but it's very predictable, right? Where the sun's going to be. Um, so if you can, if it's there, you might as well use that yeah, because right. it's just super reliable signal, right? And it seems to me like basically they go from like the most reliable and external cue to then at some point just like well i guess i've only got like my own body now and i just have to use that to figure out what right I am. yeah and these idiothetic self-motion cues are a lot less reliable than these external cues because you only can refer to your turns based off your previous measurement of your turn so if you and every time you make a measurement of some sort there's going to be some amount of error associated with it and these errors will compound hugely over a very short period of time if you're using these self-motion cues while the sun can be a lot more stable or yeah, and I guess polarization the thing is, as well i guess the point that you the, the the i think the crucial point is almost what you said that um if you use your own bodily signals then you can only the, the errors can just accumulate right whereas if you have something that's stable like the sun or like a specific landmark in your environment then you can just uh, you know, the errors don't have to accumulate. You can just reassess kind of newly every time you see that cue. Um, so I think that's why it's super useful to, yeah, correct path integration errors with something external that you can, where you don't have accumulating errors. I guess that's good. Right. Be. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if you can use the source of path integration are these two, odom odom sorry, odometry or uh, angular measurements. And if you can use a really reliable cue for either of these two things, you should, ideally. Yeah. And uh, so to maybe uh, finish off the, the, the mantis shrimp discussion, the yeah the second paper that I already mentioned is the in proceedings B, the landmark navigation. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is the brief summary that they can also use landmarks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's yeah, that's the brief summary is that they can use landmarks to be able to locate their burrows as well. And uh, a landmark is really nice. Like if it's if it's reliable, then uh, a landmark is a stable structure. That sorry, if it, no, it's just a, I was just laughing because you said if it's reliable, which 
hints at what you're going to do with the landmarks in your study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah right. Suddenly the landmarks move. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So if the landmarks are liable, it's, it's a nice positional marker. So it's a much more accurate thing than path integration even can be because it gives you a very, it gives you an actual place in your environment that you need to go to. Um, so like those very first uh, experiments I did with the landmark and without them, they were able, the magistrate were able to make these really nice paths back to their homes in both cases, with and without the landmark. But with the with the landmark, they were able to go exactly to their homes almost every time. While without the landmark, they would get close, but they'd often make some error and they wouldn't be directly to the exact point of their burrows. Um, so a landmark is a really nice way of getting to a very specific point very quickly. And like you just mentioned, uh, so in this experiment, or in the in the paper, I had the landmark there. I didn't have the landmark there. But finally, when I saw that they were being, the paths were much more accurate with the landmark, I then moved the landmark away from the home when the animal was feeding. And in this case, like even though you might predict that they would always go to the landmark, I found that that wasn't always the case, surprisingly. They would often go to the landmark, but at, at a certain point, once going to the landmark, I found that sometimes they would stop along that, like they would stop following the landmark and then turn and go to where their burrow should be. So it does seem like that that first is very cool because it shows both the landmark navigation and path integration systems are present and they operate independently of one another. They can both work together, but these are two independent systems that the magistrate have at the same time that they can use. Yeah, I really like that part because it's, I mean, at some point when you read these studies that, you know, you, you, uh, rotate the animal or you change landmark whatever at some point you go like don't they like have some sort of memory of what it looked like five seconds ago or i don't know how long you know it takes for you to make the change but at some point i feel like surely they must realize at some point that like things have changed and i really liked that there were i think you said like three out of ten or something like that like it wasn't like all of them but that, um, that sounds right i can't quite remember but yeah <laughs> um, well at least like some of them right it wasn't like all of them yeah yeah, uh, yeah. The portion of them yeah um and I, re- I kind of really, he had this one example, which I really liked of this, this one, uh, uh, what was it that the one shrimp kind of realized halfway to the landmark, like, wait a minute, this isn't where I thought it was. Then went back to get a snack and then went straight home. And, right, yeah. <laughs> um, I really liked this kind of like, <laughs> I can really imagine the shrimp going like, wait a minute, <laughs> this is not where I'm supposed to go better get a snack and then i'm gonna go home again yeah or yeah. or yeah just get to the position that you last uh i guess could account that, for yeah yeah, yeah I, no, I have no idea it, yeah. what they're doing but yeah 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 maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yes it's uh it's it's really nice because landmarks the their positional uh information is absent of error really while path integration always has some error attributed to it it might be very minor um, but it's there. Yeah, and especially the accumulation. I mean, you can obviously have errors in estimating how far the landmark is away from you, that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. it doesn't accumulate every step of the way necessarily. Yeah, I mean, one question that, I mean, the, the reason I also find uh, to kind of have a slightly more general discussion about mat strip navigation, that kind of stuff, is that, yeah, as, I, as I said in the beginning, most of the stuff I read, or pretty much all of the stuff I've read, has been with rodents or with humans, I mean, maybe some monkey studies, but I think it's pretty much rodents. And uh, But one thing I find really interesting is that, you know, we, in the spatial navigation literature, think about, like, the, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex and these, like, neural structures. And it's really, um, they show up in, in rats and in humans, and it's very similar. But what I find really interesting is that, you know, mantis shrimp or bumblebees, which we can get to in a second, you know, have much, much simpler brains, or you mentioned the ants earlier, have so much simpler brains, and they can still do the same thing. Well, even with ants, as you mentioned, probably much better than humans ever could. <laughs> probably um, bees and mantis shrimp as well, better than a mammal could. Yeah, And I find that really interesting, because I feel like, especially when something seems complex, like, you know, navigating through a maze and remembering where you came from, and all this kind of stuff, I think at least I tend to have a tendency to think like you need a complex brain for that. But I find it really interesting that like with, with mantis shrimps, there seems to be this sense of, or like with all these uh, studies you mentioned with the different species, like you can have a very simple brain that can still do all this really complex stuff. No, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. You have these very simple brains and numerically much simpler than any vertebrate brain. Yeah. yeah just going off size basically. Yeah. Doing, yeah. Size or even number of neurons. It's just extremely, uh, 
uh, simplified, but you have this really robust behavior that outshines vertebrates and path integration at least. Um, so like, how do you encapsulate this behavior in a very limited number of neurons and do it robustly? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm curious, do you know much about that? I mean, uh, no problem if you don't. <laughs> I mean, but well, this is uh, this is actually like what why I'm working with bumblebees now. Okay, so, so uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, I was gonna make a so maybe to, to switch to the bumblebee paper, then very briefly, I mean, you had this uh, again in current, it's again, yeah, again in current biology, um, this year. Um, we use vector navigation in walking bumblebees. And I was slightly confused at first when I started reading the paper because I thought, because, you know, you start off saying like, well, when bees can fly around and they use path integration and all this kind of thing or vector navigation, whatever you want to call it. And I thought, kind of obvious that they have it when walking, right? Like, why is this such a big deal? Kind of like, I would kind of be, it would be more surprised if they didn't have it when walking than if they, at least from my naive not knowing anything about bumblebees or anything really perspective. Um, but then it seems to me when I re read more of the paper, it seems to me it is almost more a methods paper to in to figure out whether you can use bumblebees to study neural procedures. Because from what I understand, the problem with studying flying bumblebees is that you need a very large area, which is not exactly ideal for your recordings right whereas if they're just walking around you have much smaller space so it's much simpler to um well not simpler but you, you can just actually do it in a lab mm -hmm. um and so i mean am i correct in that in, in assuming that this is almost more like a methods development so that you can then do this or well yeah i mean first off it does show that this works really nicely over small distances um in animals that usually fly over large dis distances so that's a finding in itself but i think our conversation that we talked about earlier is uh, is that it, it relates to it really nicely. So I might just go back to that about how how does a simple brain do a very complex task? And uh, with bumblebees and with insects now generally, we have very detailed, we're starting to have very detailed anatomical descriptions of how the brains, the the, the, the neurobiology of the brains at, at the cellular level. We can... Uh, so, for instance, very recently with fruit flies, they have a connectome of the whole hemibrain uh, where you can see not only all the neurons and where they go and who talks to who, but also which synapses there are. And you have this at a resolution that you just cannot get with a vertebrate. Um, and uh, we, all, we have this with the bumblebee as well. So, um, so we have this detailed anatomical understanding of where these brain regions that we know are important for navigation, what they look like. Who talks to who as far as neurons go? Um, and with this information, we can make computational models for how, well, depending on how the neural circuitry and how these neurons are, are wired, how might the brain of these animals then be able to perform these complex behaviors? So we can computationally model how this might happen. So we have really robust behaviors that are anatomically grounded, these computational models that are anatomically grounded that can perform the behaviors that animals can do in real life. But we have right now, we didn't really have a way of testing to see if these uh, these models are true. You know, these are so so uh, what I was what I've come here to do is to really figure out, well, can we devise a situation or advise a setup to be able to test these models? So can we can we perform really nice, clear vector navigation, this path integration behaviors in in the laboratory? And then can we record from these animals and neurally why they do it? So we can then test some of the hypotheses that they raise. So that certain cell types are storing vector memories in a certain way, for instance. Um, so, uh, so this paper, really the, the motivation behind this is to see, well, can we get a reliable system working in the laboratory? Can we show that bumblebees perform nice vector navigation in a small space? Um, and the reason I chose walking bumblebees is because it's uh, logistically a lot simpler to, to work with animals that aren't flying in three dimensions, but rather constrained to two dimensions, right? So we get, and, and it's easier to record from their behaviors and then to do neural recordings this way as well. Um, so in, in some ways, it is uh, a methods paper in that we we're tr the end goal is to see if we can get a system working where we can test both neurally and behaviorally uh, some of our, idea our ideas for how the brains of these animals are actually performing these complex vector navigation behaviors in a very small package. 
Yeah, yeah. I guess I agree. Like it is um, just to, to. I guess I did kind of slightly underplay the uh, finding that they're actually using walking because I guess it is a very. They're using different joints and all this kind of stuff, right? Or different limbs or whatever you call this with bumblebees, uh, wings versus feet or whatever you call it. legs. legs? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know whether there's a specific term for it. And I guess, yeah, if the distance is that different, then you might just actually use a very different system. That's yeah. That's a fair yeah. Point. Yeah. So you have to show that they actually were using it over a very small space. So this is the, this is on the, in the scale of about a square meter, right? While in nature, they're traveling kilometer or so, you know, kilometers, so would the vector navigation be what they are preferring to, or what they do use over the small space as well? And can we predictably manipulate these behaviors, both the distance uh, estimations and the orientation estimations as well that the bees are using? So if you have a really robust, uh, malleable behavioral system, then we can then you know, manipulate this system when we're recording from the brain to be able to see if any of these things that we think might be happening are actually happening there. And that's what you're working on right now? Or? Yeah, yeah. currently that's what I'm working towards to see, well, now can we get some sort of system working where we can reliably record from these brains, uh, from the brains of these animals while they're not completely fixed and tethered in place like has been done in the past, but able to move a bit more. Yeah, is the, I mean, I've, ne- I've never really, I'm not sure I've actually ever read a paper where they use neural recordings from insects or anything like that but um is i'm just curious like because because i guess my question is like how well you can actually record neurons from creatures that are so light um because you know i guess we have we i don't know because in a, in a rat or a mouse they're still re- quite heavy relative to the tiny uh, electrodes you can insert into the brain but i'm just curious like how well can you actually record neural activity from species that i mean how much does a bumblebee weigh like a gram? I don't know. Like, I have no idea. Like, yeah, yeah. No, this, this is a good question, but it actually has been done for quite a while now. And uh, it, typically in the past, what people have done is they've restrained the animal. They'll expose the brain and they'll use really thin glass electrodes to be able to record from single cells, intercellular recordings. Um, but this is a problem for moving animals, like what you're talking about. If, you, if this animal has a recording device that's on the animal while it moves, then how do you do this? Well, and uh, recently, some people have done this with insects. So I have a couple of colleagues. One has done this in walking cockroaches before with a, a tetrode, essentially with a, a bundle of wires, uh, four or five wires that are really small, but uh, bundled together. And you can then use the distances between these wires to be able to estimate which cells you're recording from. And uh, I have a colleague that also just had a paper come out uh, recording using tetrodes in monarch butterflies that are flapping their wings and like the the electrodes and the storage of the i mean the, is the memory storage like i mean is there like there's not like a long cable or is there oh there there is so, there so is, they're still not a, flying the butterflies or they are flapping in place so they have a magnet on their okay. back of the needle so they're able to turn and flap but they can't fly away <laughs> yeah okay. so they're okay. they're still tethered in some way but their their limbs are are able to move just fine yeah, it was interesting because I guess this is the kind of, I mean, this is the problem that was solved just before John O'Keefe found play cells in rats and then later on in large part won the Nobel Prize for that one paper, I guess. Because I think just before that, there was the same problem with rats. It's like, how do you record from a moving animal? Mm-hmm. And then someone figured out how to do it. And then suddenly you can do all these new experiments now. But I guess you're getting to, or you are at that point now where you can record from a walking bumblebee or no no i'm not quite there yet <laughs> okay <laughs> working on it working on getting there but okay yes but the technology is is around and people have used this technology to record from animals while they had some free motion so this is uh so it's not like we have to invent something completely from scratch you know that there is this available and now we can see well can we incorporate it in this system which is quite a challenge nonetheless but at least it's something that is feasible i think Mm-hmm. i mean if that's what you're working on you'd, you'd hope so right <laughs> yeah but you know you can never be like with these kinds of things you're never you never know if something's going to actually work at the end of it all yeah, yeah. so there's always risk involved as long as you pair that risk with some things that you feel a little more confident about there will be something out of it so yeah. you've, you've got like your secure project and your risky project or... <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> 
with the behavioral work now that I that with this paper that we're talking about, since the behavioral work works really well, now I can continue this and get secure findings in this sort of respect and then see if we can get these this other stuff that's a little unsure going as well. Mm -hmm. okay, I have a really random question, which is, I think this is the first paper I've seen where, you know, you have the authors and the affiliations and then usually email address. And in here, in this case, for you and for uh, Stanley Heinz, so you have a Twitter handle also on the paper. That's, I think that's the first time I've seen that. Is that... <laughs> I I, uh, yeah. I was kind of surprised by that too, to tell you the truth. I don't know how long current biology has been including that, but they asked they ask for, people. yeah, they, like when you put your information in, they also have uh, a field for a Twitter handle. And I put both mine and Stanley Heinze, who is the PI of the lab that I'm working in now. Um, right. So let's say whether, yeah, you can put email or like ORCID or whatever, however it's pronounced. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Can... So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your, your, your email, your ORCID, your affiliation and your Twitter handle. That was what they asked for. I guess so. I haven't been reading current biology recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, well, I was curious how that came about, whether you were like, I have, because I mean, you also do seem to be super active on Twitter, right? Um, um so it, I, I would I would say I'm super active on it, but I'll I'll post things every now and again. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess that yeah, that, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, let's say, uh, yeah, I guess there's what I meant is I get there's people who post like multiple things every day, and with them I wouldn't be so surprised for them to put it there. But um, I guess you're more like me than the kind of I kind of have read, it there reading, and then when something you have something to publish, then you put it there. Or yeah, that's most that's most of the time. I honestly am pretty bad with Twitter. I'm not like a huge fan of social media generally, but once I started publishing, my friends were like, "You definitely should be getting a Twitter and putting things down." And I agreed with them. It's 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 a it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing I basically use it for. It's just, uh, I mean, yeah. If I have a paper or a podcast episode, that's pretty much it. Yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, some people are really good at at doing this and like connecting with people over these uh, these uh, platforms. Yeah, and it's so. it's really valuable. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, the reason i found out about you and your work is because hugo spears tweeted about it and hugo spears has been on the podcast before and he's very active on twitter and okay. <laughs> posts a lot you know he always has like stuff about memory spatial navigation that kind of thing roughly and so i think he might have tweeted about your the bumblebee paper or something like that not sure um and that's, that, well, very that's cool. I found out very <laughs> right? cool um and there's yeah i think it's it's really valuable for finding new stuff it's just i'm not someone who likes posting things there i guess yeah i mean I, yeah. Guess I also don't read lots of new papers i feel like half the papers i read are like 30 years old mm. I, don't know, I guess that might be worth reposting like tweeting about them so you know uh, that's interesting stuff. yeah, yeah. But i don't know in some way it feels more appropriate for new stuff but i don't know yeah i mean you know i never really thought about it but i honestly if you're excited about something including an old paper i guess why not right yeah yeah. yeah, I'm not. I feel like I'm not going to get into Twitter. It's not. It's not my thing. Yeah. 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 Um, I think. I think this is my science communication, <laughs> which is great. I think that's. Uh, it's. It's a lot of a lot more effort. I had that. I would imagine, but it's also probably more reward too. You get some interesting yeah, conversations exactly, exactly. this way, and it's definitely more effort per output. Let's say. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, but. Um... In a, yeah, it's weird, weird. In a way, this is science communication, but I don't almost don't think about it that way. For me, it's more like it's just like stuff I find interesting, and then I want to talk to the people who did it, which is really cool. And most about it. honestly, most people probably yeah. don't have that opportunity, but you've made your own yeah, exactly, opportunity exactly. to do that. Yeah, um, it's weird. Like I, I feel like I attend far fewer talks now than I used to, just because it's like well, I can just invite them on the podcast. Mm. <laughs> Obviously, cool. not, not everyone says yes, and I don't always invite people, but. Um, yeah. Uh, as a kind of last kind of uh, smaller topic, I was just curious. I mean, you seem to have, uh, I mean, drawings and illustrations seem to be something you've been doing for a while. I mean, I saw uh, yeah. on your CV, you have a biomedical illustration certificate in your bachelor's. Uh, from what I can tell, it seems like it's not only for your own work, right? There, there were some things that seem to be for other labs or publications, the way you did illustrations. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um... yeah, I'm just curious, like how did... Uh, something you've just always been doing and then realized you can do it also honestly for your papers or yeah uh it's kind of funny but in my un my uh, undergraduate work um i was a biology degree uh, but i also wanted to take some art classes too because i never had done that before 
Um, but I always like kind of just like doodling and stuff. So my undergrad also was really had a really nice art school as well. But you could only take art classes if you were an art major. And I saw that this certificate was an option. So I was like, oh, maybe I can do this like as a degree and take some art classes just to see if I like it or not. Um, and I ended up loving it. Like I did a lot. I probably did enough or almost enough for an art degree as a whole anyways. But uh, like I took other classes too, like drawing and painting and just doing this. And uh, uh, really, Sorry, brief question of the certificate. I thought this was like a single course or like a single module. Oh, know. no. So it's, now it uh, sounds like it's a lot more. Yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's pretty much like a full degree almost. It's a, uh, uh, <laughs> I think like every school semester I had like at least two art classes. Huh. Okay. Yeah. And that was so by maker illustration means uh, like specific courses specific to that or yeah so I had maybe three or four of these specific courses I think three it was um, but most of my classes were generally uh, drawing or painting these are also things that I was kind of interested in as well um, so this is a uh, so I, I would say that I would maybe consider myself more than just a biomedical illustrator. But I have done this uh, a few times for like jobs, like for papers from other people's labs. A couple times I was hired to do this. And yeah, it's, it's something I enjoy. But I have to say more than illustration, I really just like drawing and painting generally. Uh, yeah. But the illustrations are nice, too, because you can actually have like a job and focus on it and do it. Even though it's been a while since my last, uh, the last time I was paid to do this. <laughs> right. Um, but like are the, I'm just curious, I don't know, the... Yeah, I guess all the figures in yours. I guess they're less illustration, often like plots and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So all my figures, obviously. I, I guess what did I do? I guess I did a bee head for the surgery experiment. Oh, yeah. All oh, right, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so, yeah. So that one I, I did, and then for my mantis shrimp paper, there's like an illustration of a mantis shrimp I put on the front of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I get to throw it in every now and again. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's I really like that kind of stuff. I think it's always cool when, I guess, just people have skills that you wouldn't necessarily expect just from the job description, which I feel like pretty much most people have, but not as yeah. to this degree, and um, often you don't know about them either. Right? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's actually surprising. I I feel like a lot of scientists seem to be able to uh, draw really well. Like I've come across a good number of my colleagues that do fairly nice drawings too. Um, I'm not sure if there is something that draws these kinds of people together in this way. That was but... a great pun. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unintentional. <laughs> um, I'm not that clever. So. <laughs> yeah. um, but actually, this reminds me, there's a there's a biography that came out recently of Ramon y Cajal. Um, uh, like there's like a big biography that came out about him um, that I want to read at some point and reminds me I have to. Stuff to all of that book. Uh -huh. <laughs> it sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I think I've kind of come to the end of my questions. Cool. Uh, my yeah. points. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. Otherwise, I'll just stop recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess like the only thing I guess I would add is that even though you were, we were talking about how you were familiar with the human and rodent uh, navigation systems, there really has been a rich. Uh, history of studying these uh, sorts of processes and other animals and in, in, in arthropods as well. So like, like I said, some of the ant, the ant uh, orientation work, the first ones were done in the late 1800s. Um, the, I mean, I think von Frisch, Carl von Frisch is super famous for all his work with bumblebee or honeybees, sorry. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been happening for a while and there's a lot of people that have been doing this kind of work. So, you know, I didn't want. I don't want it to make it seem like I'm this strange outlier that is doing yeah, this yeah, and no one course. else is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the yeah. the fresh stuff was the like the the dancers and that kind of stuff, right? And the bees was right, but uh, yes, but I guess he also he did some a lot of orientation work as well. Showed the polarized light was actually used for the first time in any animal, uh, which is, I think, a huge thing. <laughs> yeah, and no, it's interesting. I just never really put. Yeah, there were always like different topics in my mind, you know, you like separate things. So like the special navigation, there's like, the, I mean, not that I know this in any detail, but I, I knew of them, right? But yeah. I never considered this to be part of the special navigation literature. For me, this yeah, is yeah, like definitely. a communication kind of thing. Yeah, no, but the dances, what they're communicating is what they interpret as their spatial surroundings, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so the dance is actually giving the path integration vector in a way. It, the yeah. direction of the dance and how far the dance goes is 
what direction you should go relative to a dominant cue like the sun and how far you should go in that direction. So it's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Great. There's another entire field of literature I can add to my reading list then. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah.